Question number one. Your client is planning to replace a one terabyte hard disk with a similarly sized SSD. Assuming compatibility, which of the following would provide the best performance? Option A, SATA M.2. Option B, SATA 2.5 inch. Option C, NVMe M.2. Option D, NVMe 2.5 inch. Zero one answer. Option C, NVMe M.2. NVMe, non-volatile memory express, is a high-performance storage interface protocol designed specifically for solid-state drives, SSDs. It offers significantly faster data transfer speeds compared to the traditional SATA serial ATA interface, which is commonly used with hard disk drives, HDDs, and older SSDs. M2 is a form factor that allows for a compact and direct connection to the motherboard without the need for cables. It is available in both SATA and NVMe variants. While both SATA M.2 and NVMe M.2 can provide faster speeds than their respective 2.5-inch counterparts, NVMe M.2 is the superior choice in terms of performance. NVMe M.2 SDs typically utilize PCIe Peripheral Component Interconnect Express lanes for data transfer, resulting in significantly higher speeds compared to SATA-based SSDs. Therefore, if your client is looking for the best performance, they should choose option C, NVMe M.2. Question number two. Configure a RAID array with three of 16 terabytes drives with these characteristics. Data remains available if a single drive fails. Most efficient use of drive space. Fastest access time. Total storage size is not a priority. Zero two answer. To meet the specified characteristics of data availability, efficient use of drive space, fastest access time, and with total storage size not being a priority, the best RAID configuration for 316 TB drives would be RAID 5. RAID 5 offers fault tolerance by distributing parity information across all drives in the array. This means that if one drive fails, the data can be rebuilt using the parity information stored on the remaining drives. Here's how you can configure the RAID. 5 Array. Determine the RAID controller. Make sure your system has a RAID controller that supports RAID 5. This can be a hardware RAID controller or a software RAID solution provided by your operating system. Backup data. Before creating the RAID array, it's crucial to backup any important data on the drives you plan to use, as the process will involve formatting the drives. Connect the drives. Install the 316 terabytes drives into your system and connect them to the appropriate interfaces. SATA, SAS, etc., or RAID controller. Access the RAID management interface. Depending on your system, you may need to access the RAID management interface through the BIOS during boot or use a specific software utility provided by the RAID. Question number three. A system administrator has connected an external USB drive to a computer to transfer some documents. When booting the computer, the system tries to boot from the external drive and gives an error message. Which of the following would be the best way to prevent the USB drive from booting? Option A. Modify the BIOS to boot from the internal hard drive. Option B. Modify the boot order in Windows Disk Management. Option C. Rebuild the MBR on the external hard drive. Option D. Disable the external drive in Device Manager. Answer number three. The best way to prevent the USB drive from booting would be A. Modify the BIOS to boot from the internal hard drive. In the BIOS settings, you can change the boot order to prioritize the internal hard drive over the external USB drive. By doing so, the computer will attempt to boot from the internal hard drive first, and if there is a valid operating system on it, it will boot successfully without encountering the error message related to the external drive. Options B, C, and D are not relevant for preventing the USB drive from booting. B. Modifying the boot order in Windows Disk Management is not the correct option, as changing the boot order should be done in the BIOS, not in Windows Disk Management. C. Rebuilding the MBR, Master Boot Record, on the external hard drive is not necessary in this scenario and can be risky. It might not even prevent the USB drive from attempting to boot. D. Disabling the external drive in Device Manager may prevent the external drive from being recognized by the operating system, but it won't prevent the system from attempting to boot from it during the boot process. 
This option is not ideal for preventing the USB drive from booting. Question number four, which one is not an interface type used for internal storage devices on newer systems? Option A, IDE. Option B, SATA. Option C, M.2. Option D, Serial. Number four answer. Among the options provided, Serial is not an interface type used for internal storage devices on newer systems. These are the valid interface types in the order they have invented to support internal storage devices. A, IDE, Integrated Drive Electronics, an older interface type that was commonly used for connecting internal storage devices like hard drives and optical drives. B, SATA, Serial ATA, a widely used interface type for connecting internal storage devices like hard drives and solid state drives, SSDs on modern systems. CM, 2, an interface standard used for connecting solid state drives, SSDs, and other devices directly to the motherboard. M2 provides faster data transfer speeds compared to SATA and is commonly found in newer systems. Question number five. Your client wants to add an NVMe drive to their desktop systems to boost performance, but the M.2 slots in these systems don't support NVMe drives. Which of the following interface can be used instead? Option A, SATA. Option B, PCIe. Option C, eSATA. Option D, ISO 9660. Number five answer, option B, PCIe. If the M.2 slots in the desktop systems don't support NVMe drives, the client can use the PCIe, Peripheral Component Interconnect Express, interface instead, NVMe, Non-Volatile Memory Express. Drives are often connected through PCIe slots, which provide higher data transfer speeds and better performance compared to traditional SATA connections. By using a PCIe interface, the client can still add an NVMe drive to their desktop system and benefit from improved performance. Question number six. A user has powered on their computer and received the message, operating system not found. A check of the system shows that the SATA drive cables are properly connected. Which of the following would be the next best troubleshooting step? Option A, boot to safe mode. Option B, replace the boot drive. Option C, restore from a known good backup. Option D, check for removable drives. Answer number six is option D, check for removable drives. Given that the SATA drive cables are properly connected and the computer displays the message operating system not found, the next best troubleshooting step would be to check for removable drives, option D. Checking for removable drives is important because sometimes external drives, such as USB flash drives or external hard drives, can interfere with the boot process if they are connected to the computer. If a non-bootable removable drive is set as the first boot device in the BIOS UEFI settings, the computer might attempt to boot from it, resulting in the operating system not found error. To perform this troubleshooting step, power off the computer. Disconnect any external removable drives connected to the computer, for example, USB flash drives, external hard drives, memory cards. Ensure that only the internal bootable SATA drive is connected. Power on the computer again, and see if it successfully boots into the operating system. If the issue persists after removing the removable drives, then you can consider other troubleshooting options, such as replacing the boot drive, option B. If it's suspected to be faulty, attempting to boot to safe mode, option A, to diagnose software-related issues, or restoring from a known good backup, option C, if you have a recent backup of the operating system and data. However, checking for removable drives should be the immediate next step before proceeding to other troubleshooting measures. Question number seven. Your client wants to choose a RAID array type that offers excellent speed and reliability. Which of the following is the best match for this requirement? Option A is RAID 0. Option B is RAID 1. Option C is RAID 5. Option D is RAID 10. Zero seven answer. For the client's requirement of excellent speed and reliability, the best RAID array type would be RAID 10. RAID 10, also known as RAID 1 plus 0, combines the features of RAID 1, mirroring, and RAID 0, striping. Data is mirrored across multiple drives for redundancy, and the mirrored drives are then striped to improve read and write performance. This RAID level provides excellent data protection and fault tolerance, 
while delivering high data access speed. Advantages of RAID 10 for the client's needs. Speed. RAID 10 offers excellent read and write performance due to data striping across multiple drives. Reliability. RAID 10 provides high reliability by mirroring data, which means that if one drive fails, the data remains available on the mirrored drive. Fault tolerance. RAID 10 can sustain multiple drive failures as long as the failed drives are not from the same mirrored pair. In summary, RAID 10 is the best match for the client's requirements of both excellent speed and reliability. It balances the benefits of speed and fault tolerance effectively, making it a popular choice for performance critical and mission critical systems. Question number eight. A graphics designer is experiencing increasing delays when accessing files on her hard drive. The user maintains a daily backup of all data on the drive. Which of these would be the best next troubleshooting step to resolve the issue? Option A, reinstall Windows. Option B, perform a hard drive diagnostic. Option C, restore from the daily backup. Option D, boot to safe mode. Question number eight answer. Given the scenario where a graphics designer is experiencing increasing delays when accessing files on her hard drive, and she maintains a daily backup of all data on the drive, the best next troubleshooting step to resolve the issue would be Option B. Perform a hard drive diagnostic. Performing a hard drive diagnostic will help identify if there are any issues with the physical health of the hard drive. If there are any bad sectors or other hardware-related problems, it could cause the slowdowns and delays when accessing files. A hard drive diagnostic can be done using various tools provided by the hard drive manufacturer or third-party software. By running a diagnostic on the hard drive, the designer can pinpoint if the slowdowns are due to a failing drive and take appropriate actions, such as replacing the drive if needed or seeking professional help to salvage data from the failing drive. If the drive is indeed failing, it's crucial to do so before attempting any other troubleshooting steps or restoring from backups, as these actions may put additional stress on the drive and potentially lead to data loss if the drive fails completely during the process. The other options are less relevant to the specific issue described. Option A. Reinstalling Windows is unlikely to resolve a hardware-related issue with the hard drive, and it would be a time-consuming step without addressing the root cause. Option C. Restoring from the daily backup should be considered only after ensuring the hard drive's health. Restoring from a backup may not solve the issue if the slowdowns are due to a failing drive, as the same problems could be present in the backup. Option D. Booting to safe mode is useful for troubleshooting software-related issues, but since the problem is related to accessing files on the hard drive, it's less likely to be a software-related problem. Nonetheless, safe mode can still be attempted after ruling out hardware issues through a diagnostic test. Question number nine. Which of the following would be most likely found on an optical disk? Option A, document archive. Option B, operating system boot files. Option C, RAID parity files. Option D, BIOS configurations. Question nine answer. The most likely item to be found on an optical disk would be as option A, document archive. Optical disks, such as CDs, DVDs, and Blu-ray discs, are commonly used for storing data files like documents, photos, videos, music, and other types of media. They are often used as a means of archiving and backing up important files due to their relatively large storage capacity and durability. The other options are less likely to be found on optical disks. B. Operating system boot files. Operating system boot files are usually stored on a computer's internal hard drive or, in some cases, on USB flash drives for installation purposes. They are not typically found on standard optical disks. See RAID parity files. RAID parity files are used in certain RAID configurations to provide fault tolerance and data redundancy across multiple drives. They are not commonly stored on optical disks. D. BIOS configurations. BIOS configurations are settings that control the basic hardware and system settings of a computer. They are stored in the computer's non-volatile memory, CMOS and are not related to optical disks. Question number 10. Your client accidentally purchased a micro SD card for their digital camera instead of an SD card. Which one is the best way to use the card? Option A, buy a new camera that uses micro SD cards. Option B, copy the data from an existing card to the new card. Option C, return the card to the store for the correct type. Option D, use an adapter with the card. Question number 10 answer, 
The best way to use the micro SD card in the digital camera is option D, which is to use an adapter with the card. A micro SD card can be used in devices that accept SD cards by using a micro SD to SD card adapter. These adapters are readily available and can be used to convert the micro SD card into the standard SD card size, allowing it to fit into the digital camera's SD card slot. Options A and B might be unnecessary or costly solutions. Option A involves purchasing a new camera just to use the micro SD card, which is not practical. Option B could work if you have another SD card and wish to copy the data, but it's not a direct solution to using the micro SD card in the digital camera. Option C, returning the card to the store for the correct type, could be a viable solution if the store allows returns or exchanges. However, using an adapter, option D, is often the most convenient and cost-effective solution, as it allows you to use the micro SD card with your existing camera without any additional expenses. Question number 11. When a user starts their computer, the screen remains blank and the computer beeps twice. Which of these would be the most likely cause of this issue? Option A. The memory is faulty. Option B. The boot device is not connected. Option C. The operating system has become corrupted. Option D. The PC is infected with malware. Question number 11 answer is option A, which means the memory is faulty. When a computer starts up and the screen remains blank while the computer emits a specific pattern of beeps, in this case, two beeps, it often indicates a hardware issue. Two beeps commonly suggest a memory problem. Faulty or improperly seated RAM modules can lead to this kind of behavior where the computer fails to start properly and the screen remains blank. Reseating or replacing the RAM modules might be necessary to resolve the issue. Question number 12. A technician is connecting a laptop to an LCD projector in a conference room. The display on the laptop works properly, but the projector image is constantly flickering and pixelating. The technician has modified the resolution and refresh rates, but the projector image continues to flicker. Which of the following would be the best next troubleshooting step? Option A, replace the video cable. Option B, disable the laptop display. Option C, replace the projector bulb. Option D, power cycle the projector. Question number 12 answer. Option A, replace the video cable. Flickering and pixelation issues in a projector image, even after adjusting the laptop's resolution and refresh rates, can often be attributed to problems with the video cable. Poor quality or damaged cables can cause signal instability, resulting in a flickering and pixelated image on the projector screen. Before considering other steps, it's recommended to try a different video cable or a known working cable to see if the issue persists. If the problem is indeed with the cable, replacing it should resolve the flickering and pixelation problem. Question number 13. You have been tasked with reviewing motherboard form factors for a project. The number one requirement is that the motherboard be as small as possible. Which is the smallest motherboard form? Option A is Mini ATX, Option B is Micro ATX, Option C is ATX. Option D is ITX. Answer number 13. The mini ITX form factor is generally considered to be the smallest commonly used motherboard form factor. It measures 6.7 by 6.7 inches, 17 centimeters by 17 centimeters, and is designed to provide a compact solution while still offering most of the essential features of a larger motherboard. Question number 14. The stylus on a Windows tablet will no longer interact with the user interface. Which of these would be the most likely cause of this issue? Option A. Contrast option B. Inverter option C. Backlight option D. Digitizer. Answer number 14. The most likely cause of the stylus on a Windows tablet no longer interacting with the user interface would be an issue with the digitizer. A digitizer is a hardware component responsible for translating the input from the stylus or touch into digital signals that the device's operating system can interpret. If the digitizer is malfunctioning, the device will not be able to accurately register stylus inputs, leading to the issue described. The other options mentioned, such as contrast, inverter, and backlight, are not directly related to the functionality of the stylus interacting with the user interface. Contrast, inverter, and backlight are typically related to display issues, while the digitizer is specifically responsible for touch and stylus input functionality.
Question number 15. Your client has selected PCI IE version 3.0 graphics cards to refresh the organization's video editing workstations. However, the systems support PCI E version 2.0. Which of the following statements is true? Option A is, the cards will run at PCI E 3.0 speeds. Option B is, the cards cannot be used. Option C is, the cards will run at PCI E 2.0 speeds. Option D is, the motherboards must be replaced with PCI E 3.0 compatible versions. Answer number 15. The correct statement is, the cards will run at PCIe 2.0 speeds. When a PCIe device, in this case a graphics card, is used in a slot that supports an older version of PCIe, for example using a PCIe 3.0 card in a PCIe 2.0 slot, the device will operate at the speed of the older version. In this case, the PCIe 3.0 graphics cards will operate at PCIe 2.0 speeds, when installed in systems that support PCIe 2.0. This is due to backward compatibility of PCIe slots, which allows newer PCIe devices to work in older slots, but they will be limited by the capabilities of the older slot. Question number 16. A server administrator has received an alert showing one drive in a RAID, one array has failed. Which of the following would be the best way to resolve this alert? Option A. Replace the bad drive and resync the array. Option B, replace all drives in the array and resync the array. Option C, replace the bad drive and restore from backup. Option D, convert the array to RAID 0 and replace the drive. Op Answer number 16, A, replace the bad drive and resync the array. RAID 1, mirroring, duplicates data across two drives, providing redundancy. If one drive fails, the other still contains all the data. To resolve this alert, you would replace the failed drive with a new one and allow the RAID controller to rebuild or resync the array. This ensures data redundancy and minimal downtime since the RAID controller will copy the data from the operational drive to the new drive. This is the standard procedure for maintaining data integrity and availability in a RAID 1 configuration. Question number 17. You are upgrading your personal system with USB 3.0. USB 3.1 Gen 1 devices, but have run out of external ports. You need two more ports. Which of the following would provide these ports? Option A, USB 2.0 header cable. Option B, USB-C header cable. Option C, USB 3.0 header cable. Option D, SATA to USB conversion cable. Answer number 17. The correct option for adding two more USB 3.0, USB 3.1 Gen 1, Ports to your system is option C, which is the USB 3.0 header cable. This option will allow you to connect a USB 3.0 header cable to an available USB 3.0 header on your motherboard, providing you with the additional USB 3.0 ports you need. Question number 18. Company A wants to eliminate separate speakers on desktops and use speakers built into monitors. Which of the following video card standards should be specified? Option A is DVI-Y, Option B is DVI-D, Option C is VGA, Option D is HDMI. Answer number 18. To eliminate separate speakers on desktops and use speakers built into monitors, you would want to specify a video card standard that includes audio support over the same cable that carries the video signal. HDMI is the most common video card standard that supports both video and audio over a single cable. Therefore, you should specify HDMI for this purpose. DVI-Y, DVI-D, and VGA are video standards that do not carry audio signals, so they would not be suitable for eliminating separate speakers on desktops when using monitor speakers. HDMI, on the other hand, is designed to transmit both video and audio signals, making it the appropriate choice for this scenario. Question number 19. A system administrator is building a server for a data center to another country. The server will manage a print queue and provide a local storage partition for temporary file transfers. Which of the following power supply specifications will be the most important for this server? Option A is modular cabling. Option B is voltage input options. Option C is number of PCIe connectors. Option D is fan noise rating. Answer number 19. For a server that will be deployed in a data center in another country 
and is primarily focused on managing a print queue and providing local storage, the most important power supply specification would typically be Option A, Voltage Input Options. Question number 20. Company C has purchased some new computers that have USB 3.0 ports as well as a USB-C port. It wants to use the USB-C for very fast external SSD drives. What needs to be determined first? Option A. How fast is the USB-C port? Option B. Are USB-C SSD drives available? Option C. Is the USB-C port always running at 10 GBPs? Option D. Can the USB-C port work with other form factors? Answer number 20, option B. How fast is the USB-C port? This is the most critical consideration. USB-C is a physical connector type, and it can support different data transfer speeds depending on the version of the USB protocol it uses. USB-C ports can support various USB standards, including USB 3.0, USB 3.1, USB 3.2, and Thunderbolt 3.4 each with different data transfer rates. It's important to check the specifications of the USB-C port on the new computers to see if it supports the required data transfer speed for very fast external SSD drives. Question number 21. A user needs to connect their laptop to the wired Ethernet network, but the laptop does not have an integrated Ethernet interface. Which of the following would allow the laptop to connect to an Ethernet network? Option A is Bluetooth. Option B is DVI to HDMI adapter. Option C is DisplayPort to HDMI cable. Option D is USB to Ethernet adapter. Option E is VGA interface. Option F is docking station. Answer number 21. To connect a laptop to a wired Ethernet network when the laptop does not have an integrated Ethernet interface, you can use a USB to Ethernet adapter. The correct option is option D, USB to Ethernet adapter. This device allows you to connect the USB end to your laptop and the Ethernet cable to the Ethernet port on the adapter, providing you with a wired network connection. None of the other options listed, Bluetooth, DVI to HDMI adapter, DisplayPort to HDMI cable, VGA interface, or docking station, are suitable for connecting a laptop to a wired Ethernet network in this scenario. Question number 22. Company D wants to run coaxial cable in its offices for use with HDTV. Which of the following cable types should the company specify? Option A, RG59. Option B, RG6. Option C, STP, CAT5. Option D, STP, CAT6. Answer number 22. For HDTV installations, including cable television and other video applications, the company should specify RG6 coaxial cable. RG6 is a common and widely used coaxial cable type that is suitable for high-frequency signals like those required for HDTV. It provides good signal quality and is designed to handle the higher bandwidths needed for HDTV transmissions. RG6 cables are available with various connectors, including F-type connectors commonly used for cable TV and satellite connections. Question number 23. Which of these technologies do not require a backlight to provide a viewable display? Option A, LCD. Option B, IPS. Option C, OLED. Option D, LED. Answer number 23. Among the technologies listed, OLD, organic light emitting diode displays, do not require a backlight to provide a viewable display. Here's a brief explanation for each. A, LCD, liquid crystal display requires a backlight to illuminate the liquid crystals and make the display visible. B. IPS, in-plane switching. IPS is a type of LCD technology that also requires a backlight for visibility. C. OLED, organic light emitting diode. OLED displays are self-emissive, meaning each individual pixel emits its own light. They do not require a separate backlight, which allows for more vibrant colors, deeper blacks, and thinner displays. D. LED, light emitting diode. LED is a type of backlighting technology used in LCD displays. LED backlighting provides the illumination needed for the LCD to display images. So the correct answer is C. As it doesn't rely on a separate backlight to provide a viewable display. Question number 24. How many pins does a module of DDR4 DIMRAM use? 
Option A is 108 pins. Option B is 186 pins. Option C is 205 pins. Option D is 288 pins. Answer number 24. A module of DDR4 DIMM, Double Data Rate 4 Dual Inline Memory Module. RAM typically uses 288 pins. DDR4 is a widely used memory standard for desktop and server computers, and the 288 pin configuration is standard for DDR4 DIMM modules. Please note that different types of RAM, such as DDR3 and DDR5, have different pin configurations, so it's essential to match the RAM type with the motherboard's compatibility when upgrading or installing RAM. Question number 25. What is stored in RAM? A. Nothing. B. Hardware information. C. Programs aren't running. D. Currently running programs. Answer number 25. RAM, random access memory, is a type of computer memory that is being used to temporarily store data that the CPU, central processing unit, needs to access quickly while a computer is running. RAM serves as a high-speed, volatile, temporary data storage medium, and it holds several types of data, including operating system data. Part of the RAM is typically allocated to the operating system, for example, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, to store critical system data and code that the CPU needs to operate efficiently. Running programs. RAM stores the data and code of currently running applications and processes. This includes the application itself, the data it's working on, and any code and data that the CPU needs for processing. Cache. Modern CPUs have built-in caches that store frequently accessed data and instructions. These caches, such as L1, L2, and L3 caches, are often located on the CPU itself or very close to it to reduce latency. Open files. When you open a file, a portion of it is often loaded into RAM to allow for faster access. This is particularly important for applications that need to read or write data quickly, like video editing software or games. Web browsing. When you visit websites, your web browser stores web page data in RAM for quick retrieval. This includes text, images, scripts, and other elements of the web page. User data. Any data you actively work with, such as documents, spreadsheets, and multimedia files, is often loaded into RAM when you open them. This allows for quick access and editing. Temporary data. RAM is used for various temporary data storage purposes, such as storing variables and buffers used during program execution, print jobs in a print queue, and data related to ongoing network connections. It's important to note that RAM is volatile memory, meaning that its contents are lost when the computer is powered off or restarted. It is used for temporary storage and quick access to data during the computer's operation. Data that needs to be retained after the computer is powered down is typically stored on non-volatile storage devices like hard drives or SSDs. Question number 26. A system administrator needs to upgrade a laptop from a hard drive to an SSD. Which of the following would provide the most efficient method of upgrading this system? Option A. Install a new Windows license and application files on the SSD. Option B. Create an image of the hard drive and restore to the SSD. Option C. Back up all user documents and copy them to another computer. Option D. Compress the home directory and upload it to cloud storage. Answer number 26, option B. Create an image of the hard drive and restore to the SSD. Question number 27. A user in the accounting department has turned on their computer and received the message, date and time not set. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this message? A. The motherboard battery has discharged. B. Windows Update has rebooted the computer. C. Daylight saving time occurred during the weekend. Option D. The BIOS was just upgraded. Answer number 27. Option A. The motherboard battery has discharged. The battery on a motherboard is used to maintain the date and time configuration when the computer is not connected to a power source. Question number 28. A user in the accounting department is connecting to their monitor using HDMI. The video appears normal, but the user does not hear any audio through the monitor's speakers. Which of the following would be the two most likely reasons for this audio issue? Select two. Option A, video output does not match the native resolution. Option B, audio controls are muted. Option C, 
Not enough bandwidth for audio. Option D. Internet connectivity is unavailable. Option E. OS is not configured for HDMI audio output. Option F. Display has a dead pixel. Answer number 28. Option B. Audio controls are muted and option E. OS is not configured for HDMI audio output are both can be a cause. Question number 29. How many DIM cards are required to achieve a 256-pin architecture? 1, 2, 3, or 4? Answer number 29. Quad-channel memory with four DIMMs creates a 256-bit memory architecture. Question number 30. When pressing the power button on a desktop computer, the power indicator lights up, but the computer does not display any message on the screen. The voltage at the wall outlet has been checked and it appears to be normal. The motherboard power connector voltage was checked, and the 12 volt pin was showing 6 volts. What is the most likely cause of this issue? Option A. The components that use 12 volt power are faulty. Option B. The power supply is faulty. Option C. The wall outlet voltage does not match the power supply. Option D. The motherboard is faulty. Answer number 30. The most likely cause of this issue based on the information provided is B. The power supply is faulty. If the motherboard power connector is only showing 6 volts on the 12 volt pin, it indicates that the power supply is not providing the correct voltage to the motherboard and other components. This can result in the computer not booting up properly and not displaying any message on the screen. Therefore, the power supply is the most likely culprit in this scenario. Question number 31. Not really hardware, but a good one. A system administrator has received a report of customers receiving email messages from the company, but upon further analysis, the administrator finds the messages were not actually sent by the corporation. Which of the following should be implemented to prevent these spoofed email messages? A. Change the passwords on all email accounts. B. Add multi-factor authentication to all email logins. C. Configure an SPF record in the DNSD. Modify the firewall rules to prevent outgoing emails. Answer number 31. The answer, C. Configure an SPF record in the DNS. An SPF, Sender Policy Framework, record in the DNS, Domain Name System, server provides a list of all servers authorized to send emails for a domain. Any emails not originating from an authorized source can be dismissed as unauthorized or invalid. Question number 32. A system administrator has configured a VM for dual processors, 16 GB of RAM, and 120 GB of disk space. Which of the following is required to start this VM? Option A. Shared network address. Option B. Hypervisor. Option C. Virtual switch. Option D. Video display. Answer number 32. Option B. Hypervisor. To start a virtual machine VM, configured with dual processors, 16 GB of RAM, and 120 GB of disk space, you need a hypervisor. A hypervisor is a software or hardware component that allows you to create and manage virtual machines. It provides the virtualization environment in which VMs can run, allocate resources like CPU, memory, and storage to VMs, and manage their operations. The other options mentioned, shared network address, virtual switch, and video display, are relevant for VM operation and connectivity, but are not the primary requirement for starting a VM. Question number 33. You are adding to a dual channel system that has one eight gigabyte module to upgrade to 16 gigabyte. Which one of the following you need to confirm before you buy more RAM? Option A, the brand of the current RAM module. Option B, the speed of the current RAM module. Option C, the type of current RAM module. Option D, all of the above. Answer number 33, option D, all of the above. Question number 34. A desktop computer has just abruptly shut off and pressing the power button doesn't restart the system. There are no fans spinning, no lights are on, and no messages appear on the display. Which of these would be the most likely cause of this issue? Option A, the boot sector is missing. Option B. The master boot record is corrupted. Option C. The BIOS is configured with a startup password. Option D. The power supply is faulty. Option E. The LCD display backlight has failed. 
Answer number 34. Option D, the power supply is faulty. Question number 35. Your client's 20-pin ATX power supply has failed. Which of the following can be used to enable a modern power supply to be used as a replacement? Option A. AUX adapter. Option B. EPS-12. Volt adapter. Option C. 24-pin motherboard adapter. Option D. ATX-12 volt adapter. Answer number 35. Option C. A 24-pin motherboard adapter enables a modern 24-pin power supply to work with an older system and get the benefits of potentially higher wattage. Question number 36. A user is pairing a Bluetooth headset to their smartphone. What type of security is used during the pairing process to authorize this connection? Option A is username and password. Option B, PIN. Option C, pre-shared key. Option D, client certificate. Option E, 802.11x. Answer number 36. When pairing a Bluetooth headset to a smartphone, the most common form of security used during the pairing process is a PIN, personal identification number. This PIN is often a numeric code that both the Bluetooth headset and the smartphone user must enter to establish a secure connection. Question number 37. Your data center supports several applications that users must have access to at all times, with no downtime acceptable. What type of power supply configuration should be installed for the servers running these applications? Option A is higher wattage PSU. Option B is redudent PSU. Option C is fully modular PSU. Option D is semi-modular PSU. Answer number 37. Option B, redundant power supply. Connect each server's dual power supplies to redundant power sources, such as different power distribution units, PDUs, or power circuits. This ensures that if one power source fails, the server can continue operating on the other without interruption. Question number 38. A graphics designer is working on a computer that powers itself off after about an hour of work. The computer tends to power down when working on complex designs that require extensive CPU utilization. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this issue? Option A, the case fans are blocked. Option B, the hard drive is failing. Option C, the graphics software is corrupted. Option D, a device driver is outdated. Question 38, answer. The most likely reason for the computer powering off when working on complex designs that require extensive CPU utilization is overheating. This can be caused by the case fans being blocked or not functioning correctly. A, the case fans are blocked. If the case fans are blocked, airflow within the computer case is restricted, causing the components, including the CPU, to overheat. Overheating can lead to the computer automatically shutting down to prevent damage. Question number 39. What are most common power source input and output voltage ranges associated with a PCPSU power supply unit? A. Input 110, 120 VAC, output plus 12V, or B. Input 220, 240 VAC, output 110, 120 VAC, or C. Input 110, 120 VAC, output plus 3. 3V plus 5V plus 12V, or D. Input 110, 120 VAC, output plus 3. 3V plus 5V. Answer number 39. Option C. PC's power supply units commonly use inputs of 110, 120 volts AC and convert it to plus 3. 3 volts DC, plus 5 volts DC, and plus 12 volts DC. Question number 40, cloud. A company is deploying cloud-hosted virtual desktops for training room classes. The VMs have already been configured in the cloud. Which of the following is required to access these VMs using thin clients in the training room? Option A, category six, A cabling. Option B, mouse, keyboard, and monitor. Option C, separate internet connection. Option D, high-end video cards. Answer number 40. To access cloud-hosted virtual desktops using thin clients in a training room, you typically need, option B is the mouse, keyboard, and monitor. 
Thin clients are minimalistic devices designed to connect to remote virtual desktops or servers. They don't have the computing power or storage of a traditional computer. Therefore, to use these thin clients effectively, you'll need the basic peripherals such as a mouse, keyboard, and monitor to interact with the virtual desktops in the cloud. Question number 41. A network administrator is deploying a firewall to the cloud using an API to configure the device. Which of the following would best describe this deployment type? VPN, DKIM, LDAP, IAAS, SDN. Answer number 41, the option D, SDN, SDN, Software Defined Networking, allows the functions of a networking device to be split into logical units and virtualized into a software-based deployment instead of hardware. This allows for easy deployment of switches, routers, firewalls, and other networking devices into a cloud-based infrastructure. Question number 42. A server administrator is upgrading the memory in a web server from 16 GB of non-ECC RAM to 64 GB of ECC RAM. After starting the system with the new memory, the computer beeps and nothing is displayed on the screen. Changing the number and location of new RAM modules results in the same beeping sounds and blank screen. After replacing the original 16 GB modules, the system starts normally. Which of the following is the most likely reason for this issue? Option A, the system is overheating during the startup process. Option B, the BIOS needs to be updated. Option C, the new memory is faulty. Option D, the new memory is not compatible with the motherboard. Answer number 42. Option D, the new memory is not compatible with the motherboard. ECC memory is designed to detect and correct errors on the fly. Not all systems use ECC memory. Question number 43. A system administrator made some BIOS changes to a desktop computer running Windows 10, and now this message appears when starting the computer. This drive can only boot in UFI mode. Which of the following would be the best next troubleshooting step? Option A, boot the system with the Windows setup media. Option B, remove the BIOS password. Option C, enable secure boot. Option D, modify the boot drive sequence. Answer number 43. The best next troubleshooting step, given the error message, this drive can only boot in UEFI mode, would be option B, enable secure boot. The error message suggests that the desktop computer is configured to boot in UEFI, Unified Extensible Firmware Interface Mode, and the system administrator likely made BIOS changes that require UEFI mode to be enabled. Secure boot is a crucial component of UEFI, which helps ensure that only trusted and signed software can run during the boot process. Enabling secure boot is often necessary when you encounter such messages. Here's why the other options are not the best next step. Boot the system with the Windows setup media. While this can sometimes be a solution for boot issues, it's not addressing the specific error message related to UEFI mode. Before trying this, it's generally a good idea to make sure that the BIOS settings are correctly configured for UEFI boot. Remove the BIOS password. The BIOS password is unrelated to the UEFI boot mode. Removing it won't necessarily resolve the issue with UEFI mode. Modify the boot drive sequence. This might be necessary in some cases but it's generally a good practice to first ensure that UEFI mode is correctly configured as indicated by the error message. Once that is addressed, you can review and modify the boot drive sequence if needed. Enabling secure boot should help resolve the UEFI related boot issue if the system administrator's changes necessitated UEFI mode for booting. However, if you encounter additional issues or if secure boot alone doesn't resolve the problem, Further troubleshooting and potentially booting from the Windows setup media may be necessary. Question number 44. A technician is installing a DSL modem in a data center. Which of the following connectors would be used to connect the DSL modem to the internet provider line? Option A, BNC. Option B, RJ11. Option C, RS232. Option D, F connector. Answer number 44. The connector typically used to connect a DSL modem to the internet provider line is Option B. Connector RJ11. RJ11 connectors are commonly used for telephone lines, including DSL, digital subscriber line connections, 
which use existing telephone lines for broadband internet access. These connectors are designed to fit standard phone jacks and provide the necessary interface between the DSL modem and the telephone line to establish an internet connection. Question number 45. Into which socket could you place an AMD Ryzen Threadripper CPU? Option A, socket LGA1200. Option B, socket LGA1700. Option C, socket TR4. Option D, socket AM4. Answer number 45. You can place an AMD Ryzen Threadripper CPU into Option C, socket TR4. Socket TR4 is the socket designed for AMD Ryzen Threadripper processors. This socket is specific to the Threadripper series and is not compatible with other AMD CPUs like those designed for socket AM4, Option D, or Intel CPUs like those designed for socket LGA1200, Option A, or socket LGA1700, Option B. Question number 46. Which CPU feature enables the microprocessor to support running multiple operating systems at the same time? Option A, virtualization support. Option B, catching. Option C, pipelining. Option D, clock multiplying. Answer 46, virtualization support. Question 47. Mike has a motherboard that advertises support for X64 processors. Which CPU will definitely work in that motherboard? AMD Ryzen, Intel Core i3, Intel Core i7. There's not enough information to answer the question. Answer number 47, option D. There's not enough information to answer the question. Question number 48. What improvement have CPU manufacturers put into processors to deal with pipeline stalls? Option A, added multiple pipelines. Option B, increased the speed of the SRAM. Option C, created new die sizes with more pins. Option D, bundled better fans with their retail CPUs. Answer number 48. To address pipeline stalls and improve processor performance, CPU manufacturers have primarily implemented the following improvement. Option A, added multiple pipelines. Modern CPUs typically use multiple pipelines with various stages to execute instructions more efficiently and in parallel. These pipelines help reduce the impact of pipeline stalls by allowing the CPU to work on multiple instructions simultaneously. Multiple pipelines are a fundamental feature of modern processor architectures and play a crucial role in improving overall CPU performance. Options B, C, and D are not directly related to addressing pipeline stalls. B, increasing the speed of SRAM, static random access memory, can enhance memory access and catching performance but doesn't directly address pipeline stalls. C, Creating new die sizes with more pins is primarily related to the physical packaging and connectivity of a CPU and does not directly impact how pipeline stalls are handled. D. Bundling better fans with retail CPUs is related to cooling solutions and user experience but does not address pipeline stalls, which are a feature of the CPU's internal architecture and design. Question number 49. John has installed a new CPU in a client's computer, but nothing happens when he pushes the power button on the case. The LED on the motherboard is lit up so he knows the system has power. What could the problem be? Option A. He forgot to disconnect the CPU fan. Option B. He forgot to apply thermal paste between the CPU and the heatsink and fan assembly. Option C. He used an AMD CPU in an Intel motherboard. Option D. He used an Intel CPU in an AMD motherboard. Answer number 49. Based on the information provided, the problem could be B. He forgot to apply thermal paste between the CPU and the heat sink and fan assembly. When a CPU is installed or replaced, it's crucial to apply thermal paste between the CPU and the heat sink to ensure proper heat transfer and cooling. If thermal paste is not applied or is improperly applied, the CPU can overheat quickly and the system may fail to boot as a safety measure to prevent damage. This can result in a situation where the LED on the motherboard is lit up, indicating power, but the computer doesn't start. Options A, C, and D are less likely to be the problem in this scenario. A. Forgetting to disconnect the CPU fan might result in the CPU fan not spinning or generating an error message related to fan speed, but it typically wouldn't prevent the system from powering on. C. Using an AMD CPU in an Intel motherboard or D 
using an Intel CPU in an AMD motherboard would likely result in an incompatible CPU socket or chipset issue, but it usually wouldn't cause a complete lack of power or response like what's described in the scenario. The absence or improper application of thermal paste is a common issue that can lead to overheating, which in turn can cause the system to fail to boot or power on briefly before shutting down. Question number 50. A client calls to complain that his computer starts up, but crashes when Windows starts to load. After a brief set of questions, you find out that his nephew upgraded his RAM for him over the weekend and couldn't get the computer to work right afterward. What could be the problem? Option A, thermal paste degradation. Option B, disconnected CPU fan. Option C, bad CPU cache option D. There's nothing wrong. It usually takes a couple of days for REM to acclimate to the new system. Answer number 50. The most likely problem in this scenario is Option B. Disconnected CPU fan. If the client's nephew upgraded the RAM and couldn't get the computer to work properly afterward, it's possible that during the RAM installation process, the CPU fan or another component may have been inadvertently disconnected or improperly reconnected. If the CPU fan is not functioning correctly or not connected, the CPU can overheat when Windows starts to load, causing the computer to crash as a safety measure to prevent damage. The other options mentioned are less likely to be the problem. A. Thermal paste degradation typically occurs over an extended period and doesn't usually manifest immediately after a RAM upgrade. See bad CPU cache or CPU-related issues are possible but less common causes of a startup crash compared to a disconnected or malfunctioning CPU fan. D. There is no known phenomenon where RAM takes a couple of days to acclimate to a new system. RAM should work correctly as soon as it's properly installed and the system is powered on. Question number 51. What steps do you need to take to install a Core i5 CPU into an FM2 Plus motherboard? Option A. Lift the ZF socket arm, place the CPU according to the orientation markings, snap on the heat sink and fan assembly. Option B. Lift the ZF socket arm, place the CPU according to the orientation markings, add a dash of thermal paste, snap on the heat sink and fan assembly. Option C. Lift the ZF socket arm, place the CPU according to the orientation markings, snap on the heat sink and fan assembly, plug in the fan. Option D. Take all of the steps you want to take because it's not going to work. Answer number 51. None of the provided options are correct for installing a Core i5 CPU into an FM2 Plus motherboard. Installing a Core i5 CPU into an FM2 Plus motherboard is not possible because Core i5 CPUs are designed for Intel motherboards, while FM2 Plus motherboards are designed for AMD CPUs. Question number 52. How might an NMI manifest on a Windows system? Option A. Blue screen of death, option B, spinning pinwheel of death, option C, interrupt of death, option D, NMIs only happen on macOS systems. Answer number 52. NMI, non-maskable interrupt, is a hardware interrupt that cannot be ignored or disabled by standard interrupt masking techniques. On a Windows system, an NMI does not typically manifest as a specific visual indicator like the blue screen of death, option A, or the spinning pinwheel of death, option B. In the context of Windows systems, if an NMI occurs, it would not result in a visible error message or a specific graphical indication. Instead, NMIs are usually handled at a low level by the hardware and operating system kernel. They are often used for critical hardware errors and other hardware-related issues that require immediate attention. So, none of the options provided accurately describe how an NMI might manifest on a Windows system. Thank you for your attention if you made it this long. Uh, this is almost an hour long video and this was 52 questions and answers. I'm thinking about to do maybe another 50. I'm just asking for your help to, you know, for the thumbs up and the subscription as usual. So maybe I get a few do dollars as a reward uh, for hundreds of hours of uh, video preparation and um, and voice and AI uh, of course I use some of the AI if you noticed and you know, just to maybe to get rid of the the accent maybe some people don't like the accent uh, sometimes I know that can be annoying so that's that's why I was more inclined to use AI uh, voice 
uh, which was, uh, of course, the male voice was cloned from my own voice. And uh, yeah, uh, hopefully I, I can make more courses or let's say just for now, make another uh, hardware. And then I'm, I'm thinking about to make some uh, printer questions and what else i i think that's it oh maybe operating system questions and answers for the a plus and then of course the the other other than a plus courses hopefully as well like the the security uh plus or i mean other, other comptia courses but yeah unfortunately i i also have to have a job i mean this this is not anything that that actually would pay my bill so uh, uh that's why i'm, I'm kind of working very slow here because i still need to have a job uh unfortunately uh, I, I would be so much faster if i could do this all day then i would have uh, come to your, uh questions and answers uh for like so much more than just a plus 